Now it's time for our keynote address. Scott Alms worked at the Applied Physics Laboratory for 10 years, specializing in geospatial systems and sensor fusion platforms. He's now a senior device engineer at Alarm.com, building residential autonomous drones. At EP, Scott teaches courses in data structures and software safety. Scott's topic tonight is on the emergence of safety in software engineering. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, there goes my first slide. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I did actually want to bring up, though, uh, I don't have the clicker. Okay. Um, so, as a, I'm also teaching and working full time, but uh, one of the things I do as an academic advisor, I would love for you all to dabble into it. It's a lot of fun, and you um, do have an opportunity to help out other students, and we do need more advisors. So. Just want to give a little shout out. Hopefully Tony is here nodding his head happy someone brought it up. But uh, if not, then maybe I'm causing problems here. Uh, so unfortunately, I'm not here to talk to you about the autonomous drones. Um, that is an exciting topic, but probably shouldn't have even brought it up in the first place. Uh, I might get in trouble at work. Um, what I am here to talk about is safety in modern systems. I'm going to do a little bit of a specific focus on safety in software, uh, but my ultimate goal is to scratch the surface of safeware. This is a term used to describe software that is you know, free of imperfections and hazards um, through a you know, pretty prescribed approach. So this talk really is just a cherry pick of my 605-705 software safety course, um, which borrows very heavily from uh, an author, Nancy Ann Levinson, who has uh, created a book called Engineering a Safer World, and it's free on MIT's printing press. I, if you think this is even half interesting, then I recommend uh, acquiring that book. It won't cost you a dime. So for a little bit of background, and I don't think anyone here is going to be surprised, uh, software is becoming the answer uh, to some problems, um, or even most problems. Uh, as general purpose compute has become miniaturized and connectivity has become ubiquitous, a problem that Alarm.com has probably contributed to a little bit, um, software has been replacing and augmenting the traditional systems and operators uh, and replacing it with you know, physical compute. Uh, or I guess software compute, um, at an accelerating pace. So now we have people who are being replaced by compute, and this phenomenon has led to an increase in hazards that are caused by these systems. Now in some cases, in all fairness to the software, these are hazards that have always been present in the system, uh, but have now been picked up by a software system. Uh, but in other cases, as we're seeing a little bit more and more of, is the software is introducing new hazards that weren't there previously, and are starting to kill people a reality that we probably wouldn't have imagined to be even possible 10 years ago. So similarly, uh, I think we probably wouldn't have predicted how much smart devices would be in our lives and how prolific they would be and how integral they would be. The fact that I can't even walk up here without my smartphone and that sense of comfort. Um, now, I do want to point out, though, you know, I'm not a Luddite or someone who thinks that software is going to kill us all anytime soon. Um, I mean, ask me again in like five years or so. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I'm into it. I've embraced it. Uh, as of now, I have hundreds of devices within my smart home across my Wi-Fi network and the actual automation system that I've brought up. Uh, and I even um, let my semi-self-driving car uh, take the wheel periodically. Although, I probably pay more attention when it's driving than when I'm driving. But I'm going to call myself an early adopter here to technology. I really just want to fix this problem. So the proliferation of devices, whether I you know, embrace them or not, uh, it does have some drawbacks. It adds complexity to systems, uh, sometimes unnecessarily, and is often compounded by our desire to make these systems all talk to each other uh, across the entire world using the internet. Um, look no further than a simple search of your favorite search engine on infrastructure and cybersecurity, and maybe like me, you'll have trouble sleeping tonight. Um, for instance, we've seen Already across the board, uh, small infrastructure locations, such as like water uh, treatment plants, are already being attacked on American soil and having events where poisonous amounts of chemicals are being introduced, um, only to be narrowly avoided through other detection mechanisms. For the most part, we've gotten lucky so far, surprisingly lucky. Uh, but our luck is going to run out. So additionally, this proliferation has had an add-on effect of distancing us, the operators, from the systems that we interact with. You know, I'm not sure if you're aware, but you're no longer actually controlling the brakes in your car. Uh, if you're using a modern vehicle, you're simply just pressing that pedal so you can send a signal to another computer, or even a group of computers, to tell the vehicle that it's time to slow down, if you're lucky. 
<laughs> I didn't think it was that funny. It's pretty scary. <laughs> uh, so you know, if you're lucky, your, set, your, your signal gets sent to the computers, which then execute a set of control actions, which in themselves are pretty complicated. Um, and we call this disconnect between the operator um, and the controls a fly-by-wire system. So these are simply systems where the intents of the operator are being communicated rather than the actual physical actions. Right? We're no longer actually controlling our system. We're not pressing the hydraulic braking system. We are just simply sending an internet packet uh, within our own local device. Uh, so obviously, this is going to add to uh, complexity. This is going to increase delays among systems. Uh, but it also can control what information we get back from a system. And I'm not saying fly-by-wire systems are the you know, end-all, be-all. They're going to kill us all. I mean, I'm really, I, I promise you, I'm actually a pretty optimistic person. Um, and there's great reasons to have them. I know the Coast Guard recently unveiled a ship that can be piloted from like multiple levels on the ship, depending on their mission, the weather conditions. You know, if it's nice out and they're just trying to find someone floating by that's lost, you know, go on top, get some suntan in. Um, but if it's, you know, Hurricane Ian level conditions, then maybe bunker up in the basement of the, of the ship. So those of us who have bothered to learn stick, although when I wrote this, I was uh, expecting that uh, maybe I would be one of the few. Um, but, you know, we are a little bit more attuned to our car engines, right? Uh, if you remember the vibrations coming out of the clutch and the stick, you know, you were getting information about your engine that isn't necessarily available now in modern vehicles. Uh, those things all go away when uh, the systems become digital and the feedback is digitized um, or altogether removed. So we call this augmented or removed system feedback, synthetic feedback, right? You're only getting what the system wants to give you. And this plays a significant role in an operator's understanding of how the system's working, how it's performing, and generally speaking, the, their usability of this system. Uh, it can indirectly limit what they have um, intrinsically or even subconsciously learned about the system or able to you know, just perceive about the system from merely being in the room with it and being able to you know, sense it. Uh, if you just think about baking for a moment, you know, you know your cinnamon rolls are getting pretty close to done when the whole house starts smelling like cinnamon. Right? I'm not saying you know that they come out of the oven now, but that tells you like, hey, you should go look in your oven and make sure you know, or start keeping a closer eye because they're just about done and you don't want them to burn. Additionally, uh, this proliferation has had an add up. Oh, I went back. <laughs> all right, not awkward at all. Uh, so uh, another issue preventing, um, another issue that presents itself with these proliferations of systems is that even basic systems are becoming more and more complex. Uh, this has made designing any modern system just very difficult, if not an impossibly seeming task, if you're trying to shoot for safety. So take, for instance, the 737 MAX 8. If you've been paying attention to the news, uh, it killed about 346 people between 2018 and 2019. Um, the main issue with this plane was that they just wanted to compete with their competitors. Uh, I guess I'm not going to say names. But they needed to be more efficient, right? They, it took too much gas to use or diesel to use one of these planes, and so they had to use you know, a slightly bigger engine. Right? Apparently, law of physics is you make your engine bigger through the Carnot principle, then it becomes more efficient. And so what they wanted to use was an engine that was so big that when the plane landed, it would drag along the runway. Uh, yeah, not very ideal. It's a fly once principle. Uh, I don't get to really reuse your machine. It's very expensive that way. And so what they ended up doing was positioning the plane in such a way that when it landed, it wouldn't drag on the, the runway, but it caused the plane to be unstable. And if you're unlike me, if you know anything about aerodynamics, then you don't want an unstable plane uh, just for commercial passengers. Uh, so in order to make it more stable and less prone to stalling, which is just code for falling out of the air for no reason, um, then you want to make <laughs> they, they had to implement uh, some system to make it more stable. So they chose to use a ghost autopilot system uh, that allowed the aircraft to you know, just be adjusted a little bit while flying. It was barely supposed to be used. No one was supposed to even know it was there. It's no big deal. We won't even tell most people who ask about it. Uh, and they called the system MCAS. So it was just a great way to fix their hardware problem in post. It's a fantastic idea. So like I said, it was not supposed to be used. However, they were relying on sensors that were very unreliable, and so the system became used when it shouldn't have been used, and it ultimately caused the planes that were being piloted to just go straight down to the ground. Uh, the, it used a hydraulic system, so no pilot that was capable of you know, operating the plane uh, was able to physically overpower it. So they were fighting for their lives up until their very last moments. And 
when this went down, they didn't know what was going on. The autopilots were switched off. I mean, they're not idiots, right? They know what they're doing. But yet, there's an autopilot system that's bringing this plane straight down. And this was entirely avoidable and entirely caused by the software implementation that just wasn't aware of the greater system that was operating in. And unfortunately, it led to the deaths of hundreds of people. So if you're not designing for safety, you're designing for failure. You're going to cause accidents, and who knows, maybe you'll even kill somebody. But let's change topics and be a little bit brighter here uh, and talk about emergent behaviors, things that bubble up and are maybe exciting. Uh, so I do want to give a little bit of systems background here and talk about how emergent behaviors are simply the behaviors in the system that come up when you start putting components together. I'm sure we've all heard that the whole is greater than some of the parts, and this is what we're talking about, right? When you start putting things together, then you get a little bit more than what you put in. And so these emergent behaviors, whether good or bad, um, will come up as these components within a much more complex system arise, and it becomes a behavior that the entire system exhibits. But if instead uh, we look at a system from a top-down approach, uh, we can start actually controlling these behaviors. So we will uh, set our enforcement by looking at the system as a set of hierarchical levels. Right? The entire system as a whole operates at that top abstract layer where we just have to worry about very simple concepts, and then we will force our requirements, both functional and non-functional, uh, but also safety requirements down onto that in order to control what interactions can produce and what behaviors can emerge out of it. In doing so, uh, we will impart our constraints from any given level of this hierarchical model onto the levels below it. So with this in mind, a tenet that we hold in my course very strongly is that safety is an emergent behavior, and it only emerges when we've identified the safety constraints that must be held at the top level of the system and then we enforce those constraints on the lower levels of the system. So too often, engineers will try to develop or react to these uh, hazards or safety features towards the end of the project, after the primary goals are either met or they're in sight. Right? There's now room in the budget to do it because we know we're going to have time for it. But safety isn't something that we can just put on as an afterthought. Right? MCAS was an afterthought. It was a safe system, right? the, the safety component of the system that brought that plane down. So if we simply just add the safety mechanism uh, to the system as a feature at the end, then we're not controlling for the entire system, and our design is not eliminating hazards completely. So we need to plan for these complex set of controls that surround even these simple control actions uh, to prevent these emergent behaviors of hazards from arising. So instead, safety should be a goal from the beginning. Uh, safety constraints should be integrated as early as the requirements document. Why? Because safety is a requirement. Oh, I keep pressing the wrong button here. So early in my smart home foray, uh, I learned some very valuable lessons. One that I'm actually willing to share with you uh, is how I dealt with smart locks. So personally, I grew up in a house where like, you came through the front door, you locked the front door. As soon as that door was shut, you know, no questions asked. This is how I grew up. This is how I thought the world operated. Um, just didn't question it. My wife, however, lovely woman she is, uh, grew up only a few blocks away, uh, but she adopted the spirit of a farmer who lived in a rural town where everybody knew your name and refused to lock doors behind her. Uh, and rather than let it become a thing that we argue about or I bring up at conferences years later, uh, I decided to <laughs> do something about it. So I went and got myself a smart lock. Uh, not only could I remotely manage the lock and arm it from anywhere in the world, uh, but I could also uh, set this non-adjustable timer that would just lock door behind us whenever it was left unlocked. Ah, that's brilliant. What could possibly go wrong here? Uh, so the problem was, though, <laughs> this lock would just lock in our faces every single time we went to the mailbox or to our cars. Uh, sometimes we'd get unlucky, it would lock, unlucky, and it would lock as we closed the door and hit the door frame. It was a real pain, uh, especially because we were learning how to use this lock, and it was an eight-digit code. I mean, it's barely tedious. I mean, come on, let's be honest. Um, in the middle of the winter. So I will concede that it was annoying, and we both developed the habit of leaving the door slightly cracked so that when the lock turned on, it wouldn't lock us out. It would just lock itself outside. Uh, not a big deal. But now we go from having this hazard of having our door that's left unlocked too long to now we have a door that's open. Uh, <laughs> OK, I didn't think it was funny when it happened. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it was a problem. And we had little dogs who loved to escape, right? And it's just like, it was just the way things should not have gone. And it was because I tried to you know, add this safe component to my system without actually analyzing the entire system. And nowadays, 
I only took teaching an entire class, I, I realized that it, my control processes were flawed. So within a system, uh, we can break it down as a simple set of control processes where the system exists, it receives input from its environment or from you know, other users, but we'll just call them environmental agents. Uh, and then it will use the information that it gathers to then make a decision to then try and affect whatever process it wants to control for. Then of course time passes and the effects that the system introduced will inf affect the environment and something changes, ideally for the best, sometimes for the worst. So you want to then reinvestigate your environment and pick up what might have changed in order to course correct and continue moving along towards equilibrium or towards your desired end goal. So to model this simply, uh, we can just use a standard control loop we have up here. Uh, and that provides a visual depiction of how a feedback control loop works. So in modern systems, the controller is usually made up of some compute that has algorithms that allow it to both understand as well as to predict what will happen based off of you know, future actions within the operating environment. So its actuators will then react to the controls that have been sent from the controller. And they, will, they can be things from digitally sending a message to another component or to physically controlling a system like a valve or a motor or a servo. Uh, once that action has been made, uh, that goes into the environment where things could disturb that process. So if you're mixing chemicals, for instance, the environment literally adds some complexity where we have to deal with like temperature, humidity, pressure, or whatever. Um, or it could be a more simple system where it's just operating around people or any other you know, random events that can you know, be introduced into that actual process. Then of course, um, our, yeah, then, of course, our controlled process um, is monitored so that we can then uh, figure out what has happened after we made our changes and after time, of course, has passed, where we then read it in back into our, uh, goal, our controller, which operates through the goal condition. So using this control loop model, uh, we can see that with my lock changes here, uh, I've obviously had some mistakes that this system just wasn't complete, this control um, model was incomplete. At the sensor level, I was unable to tell if the door was actually closed before the lock was engaged. And this truly was the unsafe condition, right? The lock would engage when the door was open. So we could have used our hack to some degree um, and gotten away with it. But what we really wanted to make sure at the end of the day was that the lock would engage when the door was unlocked and perhaps that the door stayed open to receive an alert. Focusing more on the locking condition while the door was closed, I then had to take my system, which was just this simple you know, fully functional, fully reliable lock that did exactly what it was told to do when it was told to do using the environment as it understood it. But I had to integrate it into a more complex system that of course had to then uh, push those safety constraints back down onto the lock. So ultimately what we ended up doing mostly for our own sanity was bringing it up to a system where I had access to other sensors and I could pair that up and understand when a door was closed and successfully engage locks. But also, since I was at that higher level, I extended the time because that ultimately is what was causing us problems. So perhaps you're thinking, well, this wasn't a controls problem. You just found a really long solution around having bad operators. You, know, you all <laughs> weren't listening and doing whatever you wanted to do. I mean, users are always the problem, let's be honest. Anyone here from IT? Is it Canvas? Is that the problem? Or is it us? You can, don't nod. <laughs> so, the typical response, of course, is, oh, let's do more training. And um, it's not a dig at the previous speaker, I promise. Um, you know. <laughs> but at least in our case, you know, we were the ones who were causing problems. Uh, we left the door open, and yeah, we, had, we caused this hazardous state of this in, in our system. Um, and it was definitely 100% our fault. But you know, as we just looked at, really the control loop here wasn't properly designed. If it had even a little bit more intelligence to it, at least it wouldn't have locked itself open. And that would have prevented you know, the door from being permanently opened, and at least it would shut the first time the wind blew. Um, yeah, not quite ideal, but you know, we, we need to look at this more from a systems engineering point of view. So operators, I mean, they're going to operate. That's what they do. You know, they are a part of the system, within the system, and they're there for a reason. Uh, they're there to fill in some gaps, to provide complex reasoning when uh, disasters strike and need to be mitigated. Um, you know, the system couldn't do it, undo it himself, otherwise we would have replaced them, right? Like, why would we have someone sit there and monitor a system if they're not there? So even if someone's there just as a backup to monitor the system, but especially if they're there as a backup to the system, 
you know, we need to make sure that we are setting them up for success and that we're setting them up for safety. They were put there for a reason. So because of this, operators, unlike machines or components, they need to understand what all the other uh, processes in the system, at least the ones that they're interacting with, are attempting to do and how they're doing it so that at least they can intervene as needed. Um, this is especially the case for the operators who supervise multiple controllers. Right? We don't usually replace a small system with you know, a small automated system and an operator. Usually that operator picks up multiple automated systems. And so it's not enough for the operator just to know like what buttons to push and when, uh, but they also need to really have a good understanding of exactly what safety constraints need to be maintained at any given time, how to maintain them, uh, and how to interact with that automated process which may include short-circuiting short -circuiting the automated controller. For these reasons, we must ensure that when we design an automated controller, that the automated controller itself is a system as, po as simple as possible, uh, while also satisfying the goals that the controller needs to meet. In order to better perform their jobs um, and work within our system, operators will also push the boundaries of the system in ways that weren't expected by our designers. And it happened for a multitude of reasons. You know, in some good cases, it's because they thought that they found a way to optimize the process to make it more efficient. And maybe they had to meet some budgetary or some deadlines where they needed to push the system past its, use, uh, its intended use. And we'll give them a raise if they're successful at doing this, especially if they make the process easier. But you know, when they make mistakes, we as a society are very, very quick to condemn them and blame them for all the problems that have occurred. But again, people forget that the operators, you know, they're often integrated in the system because they need to be integrated in the system. The system is incapable of safely operating without them. And they're also expected to step in at a moment's notice when things start going bad. And when things start going bad is also when the automated controllers tend to start providing incorrect or invalid feedback, right? A corrupted system usually doesn't just happen on its own, but is usually co-located with other events going on within that system. So due to the nature of the fly-by-wire as well, it's possible that the actions that the operators are taking aren't properly getting back to them in time, and that the changes that they're making are not in line with the changes that are happening to the control process. And so we need to take all of these things into account um, when we design our systems. Um, but operators might be pushing the boundaries just for the sake of learning more about the system uh, and how they can modify the control processes. They may be doing it just to see what happens when I get close to danger. And this could be a good thing, right? It, this could be a way the operator learns how to take a system from a dangerous or hazardous state and then bring it back into a safety state. Uh, so we also can't penalize them every single time that they push outside this boundary is just for the sake of learning. And what, what would all of us do, given some button that we can press as many times as we'd like? We're going to press it. <laughs> So to integrate operators into our system and ensure that the system maintains safety, uh, we must design for their presence. Uh, we're going to treat them like another controlled process within the system. Uh, and for the controlled processes that they interact with, uh, they must have an understanding about how those things work and how they can in integrate with them, which is why we have our dotted lines here on the sides. Right? This will allow a uh, an operator to directly access either actuators or directly access some analog feedback where synthetic feedback has led them awry. Uh, importantly, we're going to take note here about how this operator human in the control loop looks a lot like control loops, and we're going to utilize this and these similarities in order to apply the same constraints that we would apply through the higher hierarchical models uh, within our system in order to ensure that the human in the loop controller is also acting safely. And this, of course, could include interlocks or um, systems that force peers to work together or simple lockouts that prevent them from doing things that are absolutely ridiculous, even though you know, they have commanded it to be so. So one example of an operator out in the wild here is uh, in May 2022, a very popular uh, and rather new electric vehicle uh, experienced a malfunction in the battery pack. So this led to the battery pack catching on fire and um, started a series of events. So once the fire started and the battery started experiencing errors, it put an error on the screen brought the vehicle to a stop, and then commanded that the main control module be disabled. Now, when you turn off this vehicle, it also automatically locks the car. So the first thing it did is lock the passenger, the operator, inside the vehicle. And yeah, it's not funny. Uh, so 
Once this vehicle had locked and toxic gas was pouring into it, the owner panicked, and the only way they knew to get out was to kick a window out. Now, this operator should have read the manual. I, mean, I know I read all my car manuals. Uh, but if they had read the manual, they would have known there was a little release mechanism that looked a lot like a window control button. I mean, it's very obvious. Uh, and so they panicked, kicked the window out, and you know, might have endangered themselves. Um, but can we say that in an emergency situation where we had very little time to react that we would know to go use this thing? And then you have to ask the designers of these systems, like, well, why is this a hidden feature? Like, why would the emergency release for a door, right, the thing you probably use second to the most in your vehicle, so getting in and out, um, you know, why is this a, a hard thing to find and operate? Uh, so, you know, obviously the operator panicked and, you know, didn't quite figure it out. But this is how you get out of the back seat of this vehicle. So just, you know, real quick, who here sits in the back seat of their vehicle? Yeah, not most of us, right? It's, uh, what, children, uh, passengers who don't read our car manual when they get in, weirdos. Um, you know, yeah, you know, people who clearly they should be aware of emergency situations that could possibly happen. So just to interact with this, you have to reach into the door uh, in the cubby, you know, where you would look, and uh, pull this piece of plastic up and then grab a cable that's under that plastic and give it a tug, and that probably open the door. Um, I don't know, maybe lead to like a Jumanji situation, who knows. So, you know, like, like I said, if you have children in the back seat or you have you know, people who are passengers that don't usually operate your vehicle, you know, how are they supposed to know these things? And we need to make sure that we set our operators up for success. Uh, we also need to ensure that we understand that our software and our systems you know, aren't in a vacuum, right? Like these things exist in a society. Uh, they're, the systems are developed by people who have deadlines, got budgets, uh, the, they got bosses, and they have to deal with customers. Testers, quality assurance engineers, you know, the whole gambit. Uh, in some cases, and I don't want to say a dirty word here, but sometimes you got to deal with hardware. Uh, maybe a software engineer, I think hardware is terrible. Uh, so you know, that's to say that our software has to uh, operate in the real world. Uh, developers are going to work um, within their you know, pod of developers in order to design and implement their software. But you know, they're going to be using the test, they're going to generate test reports, they're going to be using whatever um, feedback and standards and processes that they've received from their management. Right? And their management, of course, is going to take in you know, state of the art design practices and see you know, what happens when they implement certain things. But they're also getting feedback from the company management, the C level employees, the stakeholders. Uh, and then those people, of course, have people to report to as well, right? The company management has to deal with the government regulations, utilities, uh, insurance companies, right? Uh, shareholders. So you know, none of this happens you know, in a vacuum. And of course, there's pressure on all sides of this thing to push in the software into some various direction or another. Uh, ultimately, we have to rely on regulation to uh, enforce that things get done or that at least laws are upheld by. And if those laws don't exist, then they have to be made and then pushed back down where eventually they get back to the developers. And of course, these systems aren't just developed, right? They operate. Again, same society, right? Operators have to meet budgets. These operators have to ensure that the, what they're doing is getting done. And they're also providing feedback to the software developers. Uh, but the operators, they have bosses. And those bosses, of course, report to insurance companies. And so they're constantly you know, changing what the rules are within the um, on the floor, if you may, and how the system can be used or how it should be used. And ultimately, you know, accidents that come from that get reported up the chain, and we may find out that you know, a system you know, should be illegal and is up to be sued. Of course, these top-level entities will feed information back up and down on both sides of the social and technical model, uh, where we have you know, both the developers and the operators are receiving the feedback distilled from these multiple levels. I don't know why it's duplicated. So with STAMP, we're going to build upon our concept of safety constraints and the hierarchical safety control structures uh, to integrate with process models and other systems theories concepts in order to better understand how accidents actually happen and how they were caused so that we can learn from past experiences and prevent them in the future. Uh, namely, STAMP is a process that aims to uh, really just find the true cause of an accident rather than blaming a single person or a component uh, and instead of requiring that the reasons that uh, led to this system to not enforce the safety constraints are fully you know, brought to the surface and then can be dealt with. Uh, STAMP also has a fairly unique characteristic of being able to find a component in a, 
component interaction accidents where other accident models tend to kind of fall short. So, you know, these, this slide and the next couple slides come straight from the inventor. I don't feel comfortable breaking them up, but I will summarize them for you so don't feel like you have to read the whole thing. So accidents in STAMP are the result of a complex process that result from system behaviors violating safety constraints. The safety constraints are enforced by control loops where various levels of the hierarchical control structure um, that are in place during the design, the development, manufacturing, but also through operation. Uh, these generalized factors occur at each level within the socio-technical control structure. However, at every level in that socio-technical control structure, the lens about how we may look at a problem could be different. Right? The government will look at your software system much different than you know, your boss or even one of your colleagues. So if we superimpose you know, these causes onto a control loop, uh, we can get an idea for where we can find issues. Unsafe inputs usually come from the higher levels of the hierarchical um, model of the system, where something has told a component or subcomponent to initiate an unsafe sequence. Uh, we can have unsafe control algorithms where the system or the controller simply just doesn't know enough about its environment or is improperly receiving information about its environment and therefore acting incorrectly, causing hazardous states to occur. Uh, we can have incomplete or inconsistent, incorrect or otherwise inadequate process models. Uh, so very similar to the unsafe control algorithms, uh, here we can just have uh, problems that arise uh, that were introduced by a design, the implementation, um, or perhaps from time delays. So our goal for really any controller's model is to be as complete as possible, but you know, I will admit that you know, completeness is un unobtainable in safety. Uh, we're just going to try our best. And then finally, uh, actuators and controlled processes cover the final control loop flaws that lead to hazards. Here, the command might not have been properly issued, or it might have been received but not actually um, executed. Uh, it could be the case that the subcomponent like, wasn't in a state that it could actually operate. Perhaps a higher component in that hierarchical model uh, has disabled power going to that subsystem, and so of course it's not going to be able to respond. So these are all very hard problems to shake out in a complex system, but we provide an approach to determine where they're coming from. So where STAMP has integrated the socio-technical model into hazard analysis, STPA will provide guidance to safety engineers on how to achieve completeness in their analysis and identify where in a system a safety constraint could be violated and how that may lead to a hazard. The process is generic enough that it can be applied um, as early as a requirement specification, but it does fit into the rest of the process. But, you know, barring another adage, you measure once, you cut twice. The earlier you implement these tools, uh, the cheaper it's going to be in the long run and the less accidents you're going to have to deal with. Rather than refactoring a, you know, your design, which is on paper, uh, you could be refactoring a deployed system that's already on the other side of the world. So to sum up you know, this stamp uh, part one, our, our goal is really just to identify the possible inadequate controls that may lead to resulting hazards um, using the following four scenarios. So either the system didn't do something it was required for safety, uh, or it simply ignored the thing it was supposed to do for safety. Uh, the system did something that was unsafe. The system uh, provided an action too early or too late, or perhaps even out of order. Uh, a really good example for that is if you were to have your brakes on your car just turn on for no reason. Right? You now become the hazard in the middle of the road. And the final thing that could happen is that a safe action was stopped too early or applied too long, which could also um, be applied to the braking just in the middle of traffic for no particular reason. But if any one of these control flaws could lead to unsafe conditions, or in other words, a hazard. And so we'll use our findings to generate uh, safety constraints that then must be enforced on the lower parts of our system. So then step two goes where step one ends off. So step one identifies the safety constraints, while step two attempts to enforce them. We do this by examining the control loops and to see what parts of the control loop may violate the constraints and attempt to address them, uh, preventing the hazard from ever even being possible to occur. Uh, notably, if we have two or more controllers involved, though, it becomes a very difficult process as we need to consider the communication and the conflicts that arise between them. So if you think multi-threaded programming is difficult, uh, imagine having a system that has multiple lines of feedback or entirely different interpretations of its environment that are now in conflict. And how can we resolve those? And then step B is really just focused on once you ship the system, which, you know, eh, whatever, right? Uh, it primarily focuses on the actual social technical model and uh, it begs the designer to um, really 
document all the changes and all the procedures that are required to maintain safety constraints. Uh, this will allow the system to be updated asynchronously out in the real world and not have to worry as much about their system you know, in its use becoming more dangerous over time. Uh, it also requests that at any point in time in the development that you reevaluate all these safety um, decisions that you've made and the assumptions that you've made to ensure that you know, they are still valid and that holding them will actually give you the safety that you want out of your system. So if I can give you anything to walk away from here, uh, is that safety is an emergent property, uh, and so of course is hazards. Uh, safety it should be a required process in your development cycle, and you can use tools like STAMP and STPA to ensure that you can develop your system you know, free of imperfections, free of hazards, and give us a shot to, instead of turning the news on to see you know, software systems killing people, we can do something light, like politics or you know, current world events. So with that in mind, uh, I'll leave this up for you all to digest. But um, yeah, do we have questions? And I think we have time. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. So I will take the mic, and I'll walk around to anyone who might have a question. And I think oh, okay. those of you on, online could also could, could you repeat the name of that book you referenced at the beginning? Oh, yes. So it's um, Nancy Levison, and it's Engineering a Safer World. Uh, I do have it in my um, reference section uh, that I can share, although I will admit I didn't MLA all of these citations. Question? Yes, Tom. So I, I would imagine that as systems become more autonomous, things that are classified as safety are sometimes have to be hardwired in a system by design so that it knows what decision to make, even if that decision is an, um, you know, a decision that no one would want to make. You know, your, your system oh. is, right, your system is going down the road, there's an old lady on the left and a baby on the right. Previous to that system encountering that incident, someone has to make a decision for the system to tell it what to do. It doesn't have a gut like an operator would have or an instinct or anything like that. It's going to look at the sensors, it's going to make an analysis of the input, and then it's got to do one or the other. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how those type of scenarios are having an impact on the field of software safety because somebody's going to get blamed and they're going to say that it was the system. Yeah, no, you're 100% right. Uh, that's also my favorite lecture in the course. Um, I call it moral machine, but it's really just the applied trolley problem. And someone has to make those decisions. And if not, then they're just going to you know, blame machine learning and say, oh, well, the model made its decision. But someone's training the model, right? And the inputs going in, as we've seen before, you know, are biased. And you know, we're going to have problems that we're going to have to deal with. So I think the socio-technical model is a great way to approach that, right? Us as developers. You know, we're going to do what we're told to do from higher levels of authority. And if we don't and we start making a big mess, we're going to hear from it to the government. Now, this is one of those cases, though, with autonomous vehicles coming out and this being a legit problem. I think we want to short circus that a little, bit, a little bit and try to get you know, our voices out there so that the regulation comes before the accidents come. Because I don't want to find out that we have a social credit score similar to other countries that are used to determine whether or not the car crashes the you know, important driver versus hitting me. Yeah, you know, just a teacher. <laughs> mm. Can I ask a question? Yes, where are you? Hello. So this is an idealized system, correct? It doesn't really exist in the um, empirical world. Um, I wouldn't say that per se. I mean, we're trying to bring the empirical world into um, idealized systems. How do you deal with cost? Well, that's a dirty word, right? I mean, we have to balance the costs. And at some point, we will have to give up on safety before we can, you know, on certain aspects, because of cost. And it's very unfortunate. I mean, I think we're going to see autonomous vehicles, and I think we're going to see them kill people. But between the convenience and the features that, the benefits that we as a society get, that will be our trade off. Um, if we do start seeing more deaths in you know, software systems, then I think we're going to see more regulation, and software will get more expensive. Uh, which is where these practices uh, will become more and more important. OK, thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? I'd say following up from that last question there, won't the issue then with 
people being killed be that with the autonomous systems, it's going to be a different set of people being killed than with the current systems. Uh, That's going to be lead to a whole set of political issues. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I think the autonomous vehicles are going to be killing pedestrians. And I think that we can probably make assumptions about who's walking around and not in an autonomous vehicle. Uh, but the only way around that is, I think, government regulation, because I don't see anything I can do to stop it. You know, there's a fascinating talk. First of all, the MCAS system was designed to go around regulation and reduce cost. Mm -hmm. uh, an interesting note. I'm interested in, in innovation in low resource settings, and I emphasize open source innovation. And there's no regulatory environment where these software systems are deployed. Some of them are really, really large and important, like managing dams mm -hmm. in third world countries. Other ones, like what I do, are healthcare systems for large numbers of people. Do you have a different approach to managing safety in an, in an open in an open source software environment? Uh, I can be pretty lazy, and I can tell you exactly what I do. Um, I refer to the NASA Safety Guidebook. And what they say is that just because it's open source and everyone uses it doesn't mean it's safe. And it might be safe for applications that it's used for. But I mean, is there any software here that exists that we can say is certainly safe to be operated on Mars, right? Unless it was written to be operated on another planet, then we probably wouldn't use it for that, right? Same thing for security systems. We saw heart bleed happen with Apache, uh, a very you know, popular open source library, uh, or maybe that was OpenSSL. Um, but you know, we have these systems that are used all over the place, and they weren't evaluated for the level of security they were needed for, and of course, things slipped through. So you can't just say, well, I didn't write this. It's someone else's problem, right? You still need to evaluate it and make sure that it fits to your needs. And I wouldn't expect Intel to make a waterproof CPU just for the sake of, like, oh, this is a new flagship. But if I needed to put a computer onto a, a, a ship, right, in my more complex system, my hardcore model will... Um, enforce the constraint that the compute system stay dry. And so there should be, at some place in our system, you know, a waterproofing mechanism that keeps that unsafe system you know, safer in our environment. So it's the innovators. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can blame anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Any last question? Anyone online? All right. Thank you, Scott. All right, yeah. Thanks for having me. That was fun. I want to thank you all for joining tonight. I want to thank the folks who are online. Thank the catering team for a delicious meal. Um, and I definitely want to thank uh, the organi organizers of the event. A uh, lot of folks, probably too many to mention, but certainly Joyce Richardson, if she's around, but she, she was incredibly helpful. This. Um, if I didn't say this, the CLDT had their hands in everything. They have their hands in everything at EP, uh, particularly including this event. So thank you to the CLDT. Um, and I just want to wish you a, a wonderful uh, finish to the fall semester, a uh, great holiday season, and we'll see you back in the spring. Good night. <laughs>